All right, guys, welcome back to the Dawoods 2 podcast. I have a guest here. I've, I'm excited to have him on. I've wanted to have him on for a while. I actually chatted about him a little bit with Aaron in my previous episode. I want to introduce you to the founder and CEO of Run Gloves. It is a new company focusing on keeping your hands warm during extreme temperatures with its new and innovative designs. He's a Cedarville University grad student, a 2023 pitch semester contestant, and he is here today to talk about all the things he's done with his business with Cedarville and with entrepreneurship at Cedarville. Guys, I want to welcome you, Cooper Peterson. Thanks for coming on, man. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, I was I was excited to have you on um, ever since uh, we just got connected with Q and doing the podcast. Um, and especially whenever uh, we were doing Q School, um, seeing all the stuff you did with the, uh, the marketing campaigns to... Uh, promote run gloves and then along with Aaron working on promoting his uh, running brand. It was just really exciting to see that and see how you guys were working. Yeah. Yeah. So first question I really want to ask is um, what your experience at Cedarville has been um, just with uh, the schoolwork you've done and what your journey has been uh, throughout college. Yeah, for sure. So I love Cedarville. Um, That's why I'm here for a fifth year. Um, I'm on the track and cross country teams. Um, and I have really loved that experience. Um, I'm a runner. Uh, my business is oriented around running, um, as, as Aaron Perry said in your last episode. Um, I started off as an environmental science student. So growing up, I love for wildlife, love for fishing, and that's kind of the direction that I started off in. And so I, last year I completed um, my bachelor's in environmental science here at Cedarville. Love the classes, love the profs, and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Um, but one interesting thing was the summer before my senior year, I, I got interested in entrepreneurship. And I kind of just took a leap of faith, and um, it's because of a problem I found with running gloves. And we can probably dig into that more later. Um, and so I took entrepreneurship accelerator courses here at Cedarville and absolutely fell in love with entrepreneurship learned so much in those two classes that I took my senior year, and it shifted uh, the trajectory of where I wanted my career to go. And so right now I'm in my second semester as a grad student doing the Master's of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. So you did four years with environmental science, yep. correct? And then you had the entrepreneurship. It's yes. Really interesting. So what, with doing that schoolwork, what were some of the biggest takeaways um, with classmates with professors and maybe like some study what helped you study if you studied I'm yeah assuming you did study some no people, I, I definitely don't. did <laughs> yeah what do you have what's some advice that you have from what you learned throughout the, your, your time here yeah yeah so something that's really interesting to me I, I look back and I'm not upset that I did environmental science even though now my direction is more entrepreneurship and looking to help startup companies and that's because I think that being at school taught me unique study skills. It taught me perseverance. And for those students in biology, we know that OCHEM is a tough class. And that's where I really struggled. But it actually, it really showed me how far I can push myself to study. And so I didn't get the best grade in the class. And I don't really remember much of what I learned. But what I do remember is how to, to really to grind and to work hard. And I think that has translated towards my ventures in business. Okay, so you'd say like, not necessarily the content of what you did, but just the skills that you, like the life skills you learned? Like yes. Like productivity, being efficient. With Absolutely. Work and stuff. Absolutely. And so that's one of those things where even though I may not remember all the content, I may not actually use all the content in my future career, the processes and the, the skill sets that I've learned to be able to sit down and study um, and complete tasks and do research and look at data, understand data, is going to, will help me in the future and it has already shown to help me. Yeah, okay. And so, just to, I don't know much about environmental science. What um, would it be considered? Is it a hard major, like somewhat hard, easier? Obviously, with organic chem, it's probably not on the easier side, but what would you consider that maybe yeah. to be? I would say environmental science is probably middle of the road. Okay. Because the next step up would probably be microbiology. And there you're taking uh, 
like OCHEM 2, and you're taking, you can take more uh, chemistry courses, you can take more in-depth biology courses. Environmental science is multidisciplinary. And so instead of just focusing on biology, I was fo I, we had geology courses, chemistry courses, public policy, um, microbiology courses. And so it took a, it took a lot of the different science, sciences and meshed them together. And so whereas biology, that major is more specific, you're going to get more into the details, into the weeds, where environmental science shows you how all of those parts of science work together in the big picture. Right. It's interesting. Yeah, I know uh, last semester I took earth science. I actually enjoyed like the content yeah. of it to an extent. I didn't like, um, I've never been a very good like multiple choice exam taker, just being homeschooled. It's not the way like I did a lot of projects and papers. So that's what I'm used to. But um, learning the content of like how the earth works and stuff with like my grandpa worked in coal. So learning yeah. about that to a different like perspective from like academic and science compared to like business of like doing business with coal compared to like what it's actually like what it's made of, what are the different levels. Absolutely. Um, stuff like that. I thought that was interesting. And um, pull up the question here. There's one question I wanted to make sure I ask you and I want to think we can transition into that. Um, we actually, so I picked you up after Q school the one time. Yes. yes. And we were chatting and I wanted to just pick your brain about like, uh, before college, like, um, so you did public school, correct? I did. Yes. So what are your thoughts on public school? Like your experience with that? And then also like, um, what your thoughts are on homeschooling? Cause I know we talked yeah. about that a little bit since I'm homeschooled. What are your thoughts on that and your experience with public school? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. So Yes, I was public schooled and I was able to maintain my faith and you know I did Bible studies. But when I look towards the future, I, I do want to homeschool my kids. Okay. And so I think public school can be, it can be a tough environment for Christians. There are a lot more temptations. And I think it depends on how mature you are in your faith at that time. Um, I've known some kids who, you know, they went to youth group, they went to public school, and now they've fallen away. I've known some people who actually went to public school and came to faith in Christ. And so I, I want to homeschool my kids, um, not necessarily just for um, the faith aspect, but because I think you could be more creative and have a more tailored education. So I'm looking forward to, because I, I have a love for learning myself, I'm excited to impart a lot of that to my kids, um, critical thinking skills and teaching them to do projects, um, which you described you did more projects in homeschooling. I, I love that concept. And so, yeah, just, just simply put, um, I, I was, I was public school, but if I went looking into the future, I would definitely choose homeschool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I don't know if there's necessarily a wrong answer, whether it's public school, Christian school, um, private school or homeschool. Um, it's just what you want to be tailored towards. I would say, there could be an argument made like homeschooling, you aren't as cultured as public school. You just aren't like in the culture with right. the kids as much. Now, if you do it right, like you can still give social aspects, like maybe doing two days a week at another school. <coughs> but um, yeah, I think it's interesting, especially like I was able to work, like I've worked since um, eighth grade in my dad's marketing agency. And so that set me very far ahead and just having the knowledge of the workforce alongside doing my schooling. So yeah, I think I, I would probably say I'd lean towards doing homeschooling as well. Yeah, and you have to, I mean, you have to, you have to do it correctly. Mm -hmm. And there's, you, we have the stereotype, like kind of like you mentioned that yeah. homeschoolers have no social skills, but you know, understanding that, it's just you have to take those extra steps to get your kids involved. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, oh, that's empty, but that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess moving on from there. Um, People is like time management. I did a, a speech about it back in in the fall, and since then actually, I've been quite quite like interested in it. So what I want to ask you is, how has your experience been running a business while doing school? Like trying to do extracurricular activities, like run gloves, um, working with Q in the org, and that how has that experience been time wise and like uh, balancing? Yeah, absolutely. I. The main thing that I've been learning and I'm continuing to learn is is how to be efficient. I, I find that there's there's dead spaces 
<coughs> that, uh, you know. <laughs> <coughs> All right, apologies for that. My throat decided to completely die on me. But uh, we'll go back to the question, which is about time management, um, your experience uh, running a business while also working in Q, which is the uh, entrepreneurship org at Cedarville, and just how you were able to balance uh, work, school, and just personal life. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the biggest things I learned is that I can be more efficient. And that's that's something in business um, – I think for me, I'm, I fall naturally more on the perfectionist side. And so I've realized that I need to take what I prioritize the most and do that well as well, you know, as well as it needs to be done. And then the other aspects, I, I need to fit that in so that it doesn't take up too much time, whereas it would, it would interfere with the main priorities. Okay. And so to be, to be more clear, um, it's like, for me, one of my one of my biggest priorities now is 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 business, um, it's school and it's running, and so I have to really pay attention to how I'm using my time, and when it comes to to running, um, I will be at practice. Like that's not something I I can miss, and that is a priority. So I know that I have to get all my school and business stuff done before practice time or after practice time, and then I have another control it's like i we have the due dates for school well i need to get all the stuff done for school by this time and so i do that efficiently and effectively and then whatever time i have after that i like to pour into business and so really it, it's it's what are the what are the the priorities that where you have time stamps that can't be altered you get those things done efficiently knowing that you have a limited amount of time to chase after your other goals and honestly in short, it's just I have found that there have some, been some dead spaces in time where I thought I was busy, but I could actually be more efficient. Hmm. So you would say you categorize it as there are certain things with deadlines. Yes. And those, those are priority, whether yes. it's like business deadline, school deadline, and then Absolutely. being a varsity athlete. And so then after that, you, you position yourself to be efficient enough so you finish the deadline work so then you can work on then the business as well. Yeah. So for me, I think deadlines are helpful. And sometimes I have to create my own deadlines for business because, you know, sometimes I could spend way too much time on something that doesn't need that much time. And it, it's kind of weird saying it, but not everything has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Not everything has to be perfect. Yeah. It has to be good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how, that's kind of how I've learned to stretch my time because perfection, you can, going from 99% to 100% could be extra hours, yeah. right? But getting a 95%, that's going to give me an A in the class. Yeah. And that's where I say that fi extra 5% is not necessarily worth it because I could spend those extra hours doing my other priorities that are also super important. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, I talked with my dad about that concept too, because he said he strived, always strived for like A's perfection throughout his time. And just allowing yourself, even with your like a perfectionist mindset, just allowing yourself, you aren't perfect anyway. Right. Like none of us are perfect. So being able to create perfect work is almost impossible. Absolutely. It's impossible. So um, yeah, just allowing yourself, forgiving yourself is like, this is okay to have this level of 95% or a minus. Like if right. sometimes you just struggle with a con like a uh, class, like there can be certain classes, like you put in the work, you work more than any of the other classes in it and it's your lowest grade. Yeah. It just happens. And, but you still try to work hard. And it. yeah, like going back to my organic chemistry example, I think I got, I think I got a B in the class and I was really wanting to get an A, but it taught me that, it, it taught me to push myself and it also taught me to be like, it's, you know, it's okay. Like I don't have to get an A in every class um, because I have other, other things, other priorities I'm looking for. And I want to be clear, like I'm all about, like there needs to be quality, work needs to be quality. Like mm -hmm. it needs to be quality. But when you have so many different things you're trying to do at one time, you know, an A minus and an A, they're going to get you very similar places. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. And, uh, <clears throat> Especially in the workplace too. My class I'm taking right now, it's called communication and applied context. It's like a next step up from fundamentals of speech that they have here at Cedarville. 
and he's treating it as a workplace. Like his uh, grading um, in the syllabus is like 100% is like, I'll hire you. And then 95% to like 99.99% is like, if you're in a workplace, thumbs up, this is great. And uh, I think it was cool to have that perspective on a grade where it's not just like excellent, good, bad, not good at all, fail yeah, yeah. type thing. And uh, I think that puts in perspective like in the workplace too. It's like it's impossible to do 100% um, whenever you're working for someone. I like that we talked about school a lot. I kind of want to switch gears now. Um, we mentioned Q School um, where I really just uh, got interested in how you ran your business with Ron Gloves. Um, what's the, uh, what was the full inspiration for what R Run Gloves is as a brand and just what it is and what the product is? Yeah, for sure. So as you know, I'm a cross country track athlete. Mm -hmm. We're in Ohio. It gets cold in the winter yeah. and where we are specifically, it's very agricultural, as you know, mm -hmm. and they cut down the corn, they cut down the beans and we're running on these country roads and the wind just rips, you know, so we're out there running, you know, eight, 10, 12, 15 miles and it's cloudy and it's windy and it's 25 degrees. And I hate cold hands. I just do. It's, it, it can actually be, if you're out there for a while from a run, like your, your rest of your body can be warm, but your hands can be really cold. And I would come back to the locker room and I would just sometimes be like holding, clenching my hands because of the warmth and the blood, you know, coming back. And I was like, this is just, this is ridiculous. Like, and I know people, they have, uh, there's a condition called Raynaud's and that has to do with poor circulation and, and people have a much less tolerance. And so that's even painful for those people. And so I was like, there's gotta be, there's gotta be a way to fix this. And I heard about some people running with socks on their hands. And I was like, that's ridiculous. But one day I forgot my gloves and I had an extra pair of socks in my locker. And I threw my socks on. They were just cotton and you know they didn't fit my hands well. But I ran and my hands were warm. And my, it was just because my hands were in a fist. All my digits were together and they were you know clenched in the palm of my hand. And a natural running form is a lightly closed fist. Some people describe it as you put like an egg in the palm of your hand. Like it's, it. Yeah, it's okay. like a relaxed, you know, or you're holding a potato chip. It's a relaxed fist. And so I was like, there's got to be a way to do this. And so I thought about that for a few months. In the summer, I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. So I started researching fabrics. And mind you, I hadn't taken any business courses at this point. I was just like, I want to I wanna do this. Mm -hmm. And so researching fabrics and... I, I didn't know what I was doing, you know, like I, I was finding answers, but I was, I felt like I was so far f from, from knowledge and from, from understanding in this sphere. And so I reached out to Cedarville business professors. I didn't know who they were. And I got in contact with Dr. Priggy and he's like, Hey, you should join the entrepreneurship accelerator coming up in the fall. And I did. And it was a one-on-one. -on -one, and I think it's, I think it's a little, set up a little bit differently now, but it was a one-on-one -on -one, mentorship and he taught me so much i learned so much through the fall semester and i took the second um, course which is accelerator two in the spring and i just absolutely fell in love with working on it and to me it didn't feel like work at all like it's something i was very excited to put my energy into and so after after that fall semester i started gearing up for the pitch which was in february and the pitch i it was kind of a last, I didn't know if I wanted to do it at first because I had never done really public speaking and I hadn't put myself out there before. And to be honest, I was quite afraid to go in front of a bunch of people I didn't know and talk about it. And for some reason I decided, all right, I'm just gonna do it. And the pitch changed my life. Like absolutely, absolutely changed the trajectory of my of my future careers. It changed the trajectory of, of friend groups and it changed the how the skills I was able to pick up through that. And that honestly was kind of the turning point where I decided, I think I want to really pursue entrepreneurship. And so that inspired me to start uh, this fifth year uh, in, the, in the graduate program, the Master's of Innovation Entrepreneurship, because I wanted to get more formal education on the topic. Um, but going back to the pitch, um, it changed my, I would say it changed my life in, in three main ways. The first was it put me out there. 
I was able, like I, I did something I was uncomfortable with. I was able to to learn from that and um, being in that situation in front of people, it gave me a lot of confidence moving forward. And so there was personal growth there. Secondly, it was the people I met because of that. I was able to meet you and I was able to meet uh, professors and I was able to meet um, the those who were starting our entrepreneurship org and getting in contact with them and meeting like-minded individuals who want to go after it and provide value through entrepreneurship. That was just so exciting and encouraging. And then thirdly, I was able to start networking and meet with the judges. And one of the judges, Scott Moffat, has actually become my mentor. And we still have a relationship uh, to this day. He's he's meets with me a couple of times a week. Um, we're actually starting um, a podcast soon. But... Well, wait, one more. So starting a podcast soon, when... Um... Can you talk about like what that's about or yeah. like what the plans are for that first? Definitely, definitely. So we will be filming the podcast the morning of and the day after the pitch. Yeah. And the launch will likely be uh, likely be mid February or March. Okay. And so really what has inspired um, this podcast is we want to give aspiring Christian entrepreneurs the practices and the principles to succeed in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. And this is this is brought on by by two main factors. One of the main factors is that when I was starting off in that summer, trying to figure out how to do start a business and do gloves, I was having trouble finding the practical resources okay. and from a Christian worldview. Mm-hmm. And I, there are some sources out there, but we think that there's an opportunity to really capitalize on the call to action. Here's what you can actually do, which are the practices. Yeah. And the principles are, this is why and how we do it, mm-hmm. um, coming from a Christian worldview um, to give glory to God as our ultimate goal. And so the podcast is going to be Luke Reichabos, who is, he's, you know, Luke, he's the mm-hmm. treasurer of Q, yeah. and me. We're going to be interviewing Scott Moffat, okay. who is half owner of Ideal Strategic Partners, which, uh, simply put, exists to help launch startups. Yeah. So they do a lot with entre- helping entrepreneurs. And then we're also going to be interviewing, um, at least for the first six to eight episodes, Joe Abraham. Joe Abraham um, is a uh, author. He wrote Entrepreneurial DNA, um, published by McGraw-Hill. And he has done several TED Talks and has come up with, um, you may have heard of it, it's called Bazi. It's basically... Um, segments entrepreneurs out into different types and helps um, uh, entrepreneurs identify uh, essentially how they operate and find the correct business partners to complement them well. And so both of these men are are men of God and they've been very successful in the marketplace. And what they want to do now is pour into that next generation. And so we're really excited because I'm going to be asking questions from the, the our target market, which is which is a young, aspiring not necessarily young, but aspiring Christian entrepreneurs who need the mentorship. And so it's essentially it's mentorship on a large scale, the practices and principles to help um, entrepreneurs succeed. So we're really excited. There's going to be, um, we're going to mention it at the pitch mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. And um, we're, we're just super, super pumped for this. Yeah, that sounds exciting because... Um, is that going to be mainly uh, you and Luke interviewing others, or is it also is it like Scott Moffat's podcast? So well? Scott will likely be on most of the episodes. Okay. Well. Um, Luke and I are the interviewers, so we're our, the goal is to ask questions from our point of view. We're young, mm-hmm. we're starting ventures, yeah. and we have a lot of questions that um, that we don't necessarily have the answers to, and maybe the ones who've done it for a while have forgotten what it's like. Yeah. To, to be in our, our position. And I mean, honestly, when you look at how many people came up to Scott Moffat after the pitch or you know, asking questions, asking questions, yeah. you know, he's, he's a really busy guy and he can't necessarily mentor each individual person that comes up and asks him questions. So the yeah. idea is we're going to give you all, all this advice and wisdom for free through a podcast yeah. and you're going to hear from someone who's actually done it and does it well. So we're going to have a lot of different guests on. We have some really excited, exciting guests lined up, nice. and uh, we're ready to rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, that's the power of podcasts. Um, I recently uh, helped, or we're in the process of launching one for uh, my dad's agency. 
Um, we shot literally the day after finals, uh, drove up to Canton, Ohio, and filmed the first three episodes for that. And uh, that's why I've enjoyed doing it. Um, I'm going on a podcast on Saturday. And then uh, I'll have Andy Alexander on as well, the, uh, the president of Q, just to talk about the pitch as well. And then I also have a uh, carryover runner. He'll be uh, next Friday. Awesome. Around, this, I think, 8.30 in the morning or something. Awesome. Um, we'll have him on just to talk about the pitch and try to get the word out there. Absolutely. Um, which, by the way, if you guys don't know about the pitch, um, it's kind of like, a, I would say, a shark tank. But for uh, these young and aspiring entrepreneurs at Cedarville University, and uh, it's going to be, I believe, February 2nd, correct? February 2nd, yeah. 6 p.m. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's going to be a Facebook Live link. Yeah. Well, I think it's going to be on all as well. social media okay. platforms that Cedarville live streams to. So I believe YouTube, Facebook, and uh, possibly LinkedIn as well. Um, Cedarville University, you can find them pretty easy on there. And it'll be live streamed. I will actually be emceeing. So Andy asked me to emcee. It's going to be great. Um, and then Christian and Annie will be in the pre-show um, on the red carpet, which is was really fun last year, uh, or in the fall, I guess, um, which was really fun to put on. So I'm just excited for the pitch in general. It's going to be great. And uh, I'm excited to, I don't know, test my limits a little bit. Like, I've done some public speaking um, at my homeschool graduation at my co-op. Um, there was two or 300 people, and I spoke in front of them. And so, like... But speaking is interesting. Like, I don't mind it. I kind of, like, I enjoy the challenge. Right. But I'm always, like, so nervous. Like, some people, they, like, go up, and they're just like, I'm good. It's like, yeah. that's their thing. They're yeah. ready for that. And I like speaking. Like, I like the idea of it. But I feel like I have the nerves of someone who hates public speaking. Right. Like, I'm just like... I would totally it's agree. Crazy. It's like you yeah, get up there and you're like, "Why are my palms sweating?" Yeah. It's like, "Why is this happening to me?" Like, I, I know, I know, what I'm gonna say, yeah. And you know, I want to do this, but it's like your body almost has like a reaction against it. Yeah. And you know, that's what I think. It's like even if you have that reaction, it you can you can push through and you can practice and get better. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So it's uh, it'll be a great challenge just to learn um, how to run an event like that, especially on such a timetable. I mean, they don't mess around like with the run sheets. And the whole production, yeah. that's why everything's so, such top-notch in the chapel, whatever event it is at Cedarville. So just hats off to the – it's PSG, right? Is that their, the team that runs it? Is that the name? I I'm forget, not sure. I forget the – but the group who runs it, the production team, they're just really great. And I they worked are. with them in the fall um, helping with that. So, But, yeah, I think we can go back to Run Gloves. Um, you were talking about just uh, creating the product – Right. Um, and if you don't mention more of like exactly what the product is, I think you were kind of getting there. Yeah. Um, and uh, just how the business has grown over the past uh, few months. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I have my product in my backpack. I oh, you grab do? Real quick. Yeah. Grab it. Go for yeah. it. But yeah, we had uh, you at Q School. Um, Carrie Overbrenner brought you and I believe Eve up as well with the original Sin Cookies. Um, just kind of showcasing what you guys have done. And then they also showcased uh, the email campaign that you guys did right uh, along with the uh was it like um surveys is that how you yes to use like surveys to funnel into your emails yes and stuff like that so i'd love to talk about that after we see uh yeah we got of here. course of yeah. course so I've, I've kind of described it already but yeah essentially it's it's uh it's a mitt okay. that keeps your hands in you know natural running form nice. and it, there's a it's basically it's a thermal chamber so it's a it's a polar tech fleece on the inside and the outside is a Polar Tech power shield, which is windproof, okay. waterproof, but it's it's breathable fabric. So it's not technically waterproof because we have seams here, but you could put this under a sink and the inside would still stay dry. Okay. So the idea is keeps you warm and comfortable even in cold weather, um, and even if it's snowing. And so basically, the way that you put it on, um, there's a there's a thumb seam here, okay. and you just Slip your hand in. Now you got your lightly closed fist, and there's nice. an elastic band, so you're ready to go. So I would say these these are great for when it's under 25 degrees. Okay, under 25. But uh, then again, there's different tolerances for people. Some people with Raynaud's, they probably do a little bit warmer. Some people have great circulation, and they could you know they still run 15 degrees with no gloves. Yeah. So, but yeah, this is this is the the first the first round, and um, I'm actually hoping to make some alteration soon i know 
Aaron Perry on, on the on the podcast, he mentioned he was reading the Lean Startup, and I just I just read that over Christmas break. Yeah. And so the idea is to get feedback and do small batches and start and change things up yeah. um, that best fits your your segment, your customer segment. So I've been actually learning a lot through surveys after yeah. people who have bought the product as well, which I get into. Mm. But you mentioned um, getting people's emails yeah, yeah, the and doing email campaign, marketing. Right, yeah. So. I met with Dr. Oberbrunner in his office and I, I told him what I was, I, I, I already started getting, doing surveys just for market research. Cause I really wanted to figure out like, are people going to care if their, you know, if their hand is like this and they can't grab anything, mm -hmm. is that a concern to people? Um, I want to know what, you know, how, how many people of, of, you know, the 50 million runners in America, like what percentage of people actually run three more days a week or run in cold weather? And so there's a lot of questions I want to answer. And I put a question at, in at the end that said, um, do you mind if I reach out with updates um, or um, that sort of thing, and if I can reach out to you? And I put that question at the end and I've had you know, 80% of my respondents say, yes, I'd love to reach out to you. But essentially, um, Dr. Oberburn was like, you got an amazing um, system set up that you don't even know about. And so he said, continue to get the market research, continue to get the emails and the people um, that want to help contribute. Um, and then he told me about a way to do email marketing. Okay. Um, but I should mention, um, what, the way I, I got the emails is, Perry mentioned it, is through a Strava, which is a social media for athletes where you post your workouts. And there's like little maps that show everything and there's clubs. So there's community on there, and basically, I, I wrote up a little blurb, and I was like, "Hey, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a student. I'm starting a business, and I want to provide value to our running community. Um, will you guys help me um, if you live in cold weather um, to to fill out a survey to help me learn more and provide better value?" And I've had over 900 people fill out this survey, and it's like, wow, like. Yeah. I was blown away by the support of the running community and also like the fact that that you know Perry mentioned this but like I didn't pay any I didn't pay anything and you know most people they do ad spends you know they they have to pay a certain amount but I've had 80% of those 900 people say yes reach out again and so um oh, I so that means you're running almost 700 to like 750 emails now that you have yeah for your campaign essentially wow. yeah yeah awesome. so um Basically, Dr. Oberman was like, you got to do you got to do something about this. You can start selling right now. Um, and so essentially, he drew on the whiteboard a funnel and he's like, you already have people in the top of the funnel and right, it gets narrower down to the point of sale. Mm -hmm. And he's like, before you try to start selling people something, mm -hmm. the first thing you need to do is is provide value. Yeah. So he said so. He said, send three emails. Mm -hmm. The first one, give them something. The second one, draw them in, invite them in. And the third one, offer and give them something again. Yeah. And so essentially, the first one, he's like, you know, you don't have you don't have money to just give people stuff. But what you do have is knowledge. And so my first email that I sent out was, um, and I had about, about 300 or 400 emails at this time when I did this first marketing campaign. But the first email I sent out was, thank you for filling out this survey. Here are four running tips for cold weather that I have found and I hope can help you out. And so all it was was I didn't ask for anything. I didn't even tell them the product that I had. All I did was give them knowledge and wisdom. And then I, a couple of days later, I sent my second email out, which was to draw them in. And I took a video of myself. And I said, thank you again for taking the survey. And I invited them to follow me along in my entrepreneurial journey. And they got to see my face. They got to hear a little bit about my background. And I didn't ask them to buy anything. I didn't ask them to sign up for anything. I just gave them something mm -hmm. and something else. I tried to draw them into my journey in my community. Email three, a day or two later, was I want to give you guys a discount because you've been following along and you've been helping me out. So I said, here is 15% off of my product. And um, I used, by the way, I used like Canva 
to do to make it look professional. Right. And, yeah. But I gave him a fifteen percent off coupon code to my website, and I linked my website. And it was just it was again I was like thank you guys for being along, and part of my journey. And I was blown away. I sent the email out. I didn't really expect anything to happen. Before I know it, my phone's going off from orders from people I don't know, never talked yeah. to, don't know their names, and it's like, wow, this is like this is actually working. And so you know, in a few days, I had sold a few hundred dollars worth of my product. And I, I I was looking it up this morning. I think through doing those email camp that one email campaign, I think I've sold nearly or over a thousand dollars worth of product and from to how, people I don't know. Like just from the campaign strava those people yeah how many units would that be like would you say in the dozens a couple dozen units yeah just a couple dozen and wow. so the idea is so now i have you more emails and I, i'm gonna i have a plan i just got some more inventory in yep. i actually ran out of inventory which was crazy so you were sold out so i was sold out i mean it was a small batch. it was a yeah. small batch but i was sold out yeah and so the next step is i have i'm getting more inventory in soon mm. um i have some of it and then i'm going to do a similar thing again where i, I give okay and give, draw in, and then give them a, a coupon code. Because it's more than just trying to sell a product, you're trying to add value. Yeah. And part of the brand is is a community, mm -hmm. you know? And so... Especially the, with the way you started it. Like, you didn't start it as like, oh, how can I make money in the running? Right. It was like, right. I have this problem, it's annoying. Exactly. And it's probably an actual problem with some people with that, like, uh, bad circulation in their hands. And so you made a product to help with that. So like you're actually like just helping people yeah. with it. And so you said also you were thinking about a second revision or like yes. version of the glove. Is that a part of your plan with like some other email campaigns? Yeah. So I sent out an email a couple weeks ago and I was like, thank you all for, for purchasing gloves. And I was like, I really want to hear your feedback, what you think about gloves. Mm -hmm. What do you love? Yeah. And what are, what are some things that, that you wish would be different? And... And I was like, be honest, you're not going to hurt my feelings. But what are some things that you wish would be different? And I got some really valuable information from people who have worn the gloves. Mm -hmm. And um, that's that's kind of where I'm going to be taking the next edition, the next generation, is I'm going to add some of those things that were, um, were suggested, um, that were said multiple times. And that's part of, that's part of like the lean startup. You, you're learning through small batches. And then so now this, you know, I can create another small batch with these new uh, implementations and I can see how people like them and how things change because I want to, I mean, the whole goal is to provide the most value to your target market. And that's, that's the goal. And that's what the point of understanding what they like and what they don't like. And so I'm going to be making a more lighter weight version because these guys, I mean, I would say it's like 25 degrees and below. Okay. Um, they're they're quite warm. They're you know, they're dual layered, and I've had some people say, you know, I I think we could use a more a more lightweight version. Okay. So, I'm working on one of those, and I'm also working on a way to expand um, the fabric where you could actually reach your hand out to like tie your shoes. Uh, okay. And so there's a couple um, ways that we're we are work uh, working on um, improving, mm -hmm. and um, this is from the customer feedback. Nice. Oh, that's can I actually I wanna show yeah, that again. For sure. I, I looked at it, I remember back um after Q school and talked about it. And then what I really appreciated is like I was gonna buy one. I was like, okay, I'll support and this is really cool. And I had like a five K I was gonna do like two days after. I felt awful that day, so I didn't actually run the five K. <laughs> but um you were like, How cool is it gonna be? And I was like, uh, thirty, whatever. I was like he was like, Unless you have like like bad circulation and I have that problem it's like you don't want your hands to be too warm right and so i appreciated that you were like just trying to help me it's like this is a cool product i like it but it's definitely not for the situation that you were going to use it for definitely um so i really appreciated that from you of course um but i mean these things look legit they feel good um especially because this is like v1 well other than like some other prototypes you've probably yeah made, but like this is number one yes that's cool and i know you talked about um different colors so is this what color did you start off with did you have an all black and is this i had an all black color yeah, yeah that's the second okay. color and so it's really interesting i'm working with a small manufacturer okay. up in michigan and to get actually so the polar tech material is is a very high quality material and they 
pretty much only sell to large companies. Okay. And so we're actually, I believe she's purchasing the material like secondhand from a large company who's bought it and reselling it. Okay. And because it's, and because it's quite expensive, there are all, and because it, it's not sold directly from Polar Tech itself, mm -hmm. um, the colors are at this point somewhat limited okay. in what we can choose. And so Navy became available. We jumped on that. Mm -hmm. um, coming by the end of the month, I will have olive color. Um, and I think olive and some more navy coming in. Okay, nice. So the idea is eventually to expand. And as we the quantities get larger, then we can afford to get larger uh, rolls of different colors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But just starting off, it's like we'll have a few colors and uh, hopefully continue to, to move on from there. But hey, they're Cedarville colors. Yeah, I know. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause what, I'm, I think I asked this and I forget, what color does the Cedarville um, team that you run for wear, like for meats? And stuff? Yeah, so it, typically it's a navy bottom and it's like a yellow gold top. Okay, okay, so yeah, that matches it. That's yeah. awesome. Um, one thing I actually thought about, and since it's a cold weather item, I feel like holiday deals and campaigns would be like, for Christmas, yes. Because you know, you're like, man, it's getting really cold. Yeah, I'm out here running. Have you thought about like coming into next year, um, if you would start diving into like running holiday deals, campaigns like that? Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And I, I did like, I did send out another email. It was like a Black Friday deal, mm -hmm. and I got a, one or two sales from that. Um, that at that point, my inventory was running pretty low. Yeah, but I think you're you're on to something. Um, because right around that Christmas time is when the weather is starting to starting to go bad yeah. and get a little bit chillier, and so I definitely would like to have a more um, planned seasonal campaign. Yeah, and I think having the summer, having some time to to plan that out because my product's more of a seasonal product. I think that's going to be a way to become even more successful next year. Yeah, and uh, also one thing I actually just thought about with all the people that you purchased and you said you asked on Strava, like if you're in the cold area, um, what do you think about this product? Have you put in your survey like where they're from, like specific states or countries, just to see a demographic of like where you're selling to? I think that would have been a very smart move. Okay. Um, and I probably should have also included um, male or female. But okay. yeah. so if I were to do it again, I would add those things because mm -hmm. I think that's good data. Um, but just saying like from where I've sold to, um, sold, uh, several to, in the Colorado area, okay. um, the Michigan area, Ohio, some in West Virginia. Okay. And so there's a good, I, I can see where I've gotten orders from um, who've actually bought, which I can use that data. Um, but it seems to be that the Strava group was from a pretty diverse set of regions. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, but not any from Florida yeah. or anything yeah, like that. Not from down there. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, I thought about the seasonal thing. It's like, if you're in the middle of the summer, it's like I'm not buying this. It's like it's warm right now. I don't need the I don't need gloves. And then right. it's like December. It's like man, I really need these. <laughs> it's like getting cold. So, well, that's awesome. Have you? So I know with Aaron, um, Ultralight, um, he is envisioning a brand, not just like he has his hat, which is like a great product. Right. Um, and that's what he started with. And then he mentioned that he had another product. I actually wear that hat all the time. You do? Yeah. Like it is my brother. He's on the team as well. He's like, this is my favorite hat. So do you actually use the pockets for stuff? I, well, I've used it for my ID several times. Okay. Like if I don't have a pocket, you know, because if I'm running straight from my dorm, it's nice to have my ID. Yeah. Um, and I think what he's, he's probably going more towards people who have key fobs and, and uh, gels, yeah. if I were to imagine. Um, but so it, it does fit my ID, which is really nice. Um, but even just the general fit of the hat and just the, the material, um, it's good quality and, you know, my my brother wears it all the time. I wear it all my time, all the time, and I've got a couple friends who who love it as well. So nice. it's yeah. a quality hat. Yeah, definitely. yeah, it really is a nice hat. And I like like he's he has a target audience for it too. It's like he's going for an ultra marathon. Like even though you guys you guys like you said you run more like in the ten to twenty range. Is that miles wise or where do you like normally run? Like what's your normal distance? Yeah, so a week um, we have guys that range from like sixty miles a week to over a hundred miles a week. Oh wow. And so it depends on the time of the season. Um, but like right now, um, my goal is to do about 60 miles a week for track. And so, you know, it depends on 
it could be you know, eight to ten miles a day mm -hmm. um, with long runs you know 14 15 miles yeah um, so it's it's nice to be able to I mean his hat has proven to be good for those those types of runs as well yeah. so yeah kind of know he's going after like the ultra marathon which is like, yeah he's training right now for that really probably one of the hardest runs in the world it's like the hundred mile up in the Leadville Colorado. yeah yeah the altitude's like insane it's like 15,000 feet altitude like, yeah, I think it is it twelve, twelve. I don't know. I thought it was twelve thousand, but it's like I think it's, Leadville is like the is the highest altitude town in the U.S. Yeah, it's one of the highest. It's like it's, it's just an insane run, and it's yeah. hundred miles at that altitude. Yeah, so he's like training for like eight months for that, which is insane. I so wow. I mean, I've I've seen like videos of people doing it, and it looks it looks insane. So yeah. I'm excited to see him do it. Yes, but I guess yeah. To stem off from that. Do you have visions of other products as of now? Relating to gloves and like obviously you're kind of geared towards more cold weather stuff. Do you have any plans, visions for that? Yeah, and I think right now my main focus is perfecting gloves. The, the gloves in the okay. winter mitt. But definitely I would like to expand the product line. Yeah. And it's where, you know, it, I would like my, my product line to be an innovation. I, mean, I don't want to just like slap my logo on a headband and sell it. Like yeah. I want to find a way to make it to make it better. Mm -hmm. And so... I think that's going to take a little bit more time and thought, but the end goal is to have a brand with an array of products. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I have class in about 15 <laughs> minutes. Um, I wish we could keep talking because there's like so much more to unpack with everything, but um, I'm really inspired by what you're doing. You're creating a product and a brand and you're giving value. You're not just trying to make money. Um, you're helping people with a problem and a need that they have. And um, it's just been inspiring to see what you're doing, what you and Aaron are doing, just everything here at Cedarville. So, guys, remember thank the you. pitch. And I just want to thank you for coming on and chatting with me. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Maybe another episode at some point. Yeah, 100%. I'd like to see what uh, all these campaigns and just like how you grow over the next uh, months or a few years. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. All right. Guys, thank you for tuning in. Um, this is the 11th episode of the Davos 2 podcast. Uh, go check out Cooper um, and Run Gloves down in the description. Check out social media, his website, and check out his product. Maybe a discount code if we have one. We'll see. It'll all be down in the description. Thank you, guys. See you later.